Hi, welcome to a lecture on monochromatic waves. Here by waves, we're talking about uh, radio frequency waves specifically, but this is of course true for other types of waves. And by the term monochromatic, what we mean is a wave which consists of a single frequency and zero bandwidth, which is a fancy way of saying a sinusoid. Now, even though we're going to restrict our attention to sinusoids, you should note that this is barely a limitation. And the reason is Fourier analysis. Fourier analysis simply is the process of analyzing arbitrary waveforms as superpositions, that is, as sums of sinusoids. So anything we do for a sinusoid, we can extend to analysis of broader band signals, arbitrary signals, uh, simply by determining what combinations of sinusoids those more complicated waveforms consist of. So here I'm showing a picture of a wave being generated by an antenna. So here's the antenna over here on the left. The antenna is driven by a source, and the uh, source waveform consists of a real-valued constant, uh, capital A, and um, it's sinusoidal, so cosine function. Omega is positive and real. That's the angular frequency, how many radians per second, and then uh, time. And it doesn't matter whether that's a current or a voltage or whatever. This applies in either case. Um, the analysis we're going to do here does not uh, depend on that particular distinction. So the antenna is driven by the sinusoidal source. In response, the antenna creates a wave. That wave travels outward away from the antenna. Uh, the red lines here are surfaces of constant phase. And here I'm showing increasing distance from the antenna as the variable uh, little r. Now, just as it does not matter whether the antenna is driven by a current or a voltage, what, what it is that I'm assuming there, uh, it also does not matter what I am assuming as my metric for measuring the electromagnetic field. Uh, the analysis here applies to uh, the electric field intensity, it applies to the magnetic field intensity, measure any one component of those things. Uh, it does not matter. Everything I'm about to say here is general to all of that. The key idea here is that there is an input, which is this thing, A cosine omega t, and there is an output, which is the wave. And the wave is being measured as a function of uh, distance and time. Now, the wave along the R, that is distance axis, has the form B, which is a real positive constant, and then a cosine function. That cosine function has a time dependence in it, omega t. It has a distance dependence on it, beta times R. We'll get to beta here in a moment. And then there could be an additional positive constant, uh, the variable psi here, and uh, that's what we refer to typically as the phase. So the argument of cosine has a time dependence, a distance dependence, and then an additional phase. So you could fairly ask, how do we know that that A cosine omega t at the input yields this B cosine omega t minus beta r plus psi at the output, so to speak? Uh, how do we know that this thing should be the form of the wave? The long answer, of course, is that electromagnetic waves are governed by Maxwell's equations. You can take the four Maxwell's equations and reduce them to two wave equations, which have a vector form. And you can reduce those to scalar wave equations. And then you could do the analysis that I just kind of implied uh, in the picture above, and you would see that this is true. There's an easier way to see that this is going to be true. And it depends only on you believing that Maxwell's equations describe a linear system. Let me elaborate. So in linear system theory, uh, from that perspective, our time domain input, a cosine omega t, and at any point in space, we have a linear time invariant system. LTI means linear time invariant system. The only thing a linear time invariant system can do to a sinusoid is change its magnitude, and change its phase. It may not change its frequency. I think you know this from very basic signals and systems theory. So the only thing an LTI system can do is change magnitude and phase. Similarly, 
we also have a linear space invariant system. That is, if we imagine the input as being a cosine minus beta r, that is just considering the space dependence, then at any moment in time, the linear space invariant system transforms that into something that has a potentially different magnitude, the same dependence beta, and possibly a different phase uh, psi. So we see that this is a dual relationship here. Uh, Maxwell's equations describe a linear time invariant system and a system that's also uh, invariant with space. So in general, if we have at some reference position in time and space, a cosine omega t minus beta r as the thing that's describing the wave, then any other time and position, the Sign the waveform can be different only in the magnitude and only in the phase. Omega can't be changed and beta can't be changed. So that's really uh, cuts through uh, a lot of electromagnetic theory here. You just have to know that linear time and space invariant systems can change only the magnitude and phase. They can't change the frequency. So, not yet answered, what is this thing beta? We see it's somehow similar to omega, the angular frequency, the thing that describes frequency, and yet somehow different. It applies to uh, distance, positions in space. So to see this, first consider the time domain aspect of this thing. So we'll freeze a position. We'll take a position in space, r equals r naught, and we'll plot the waveform. So the waveform looks like this at any one position in space. It varies with time sinusoidally. And as you know, the separation between two points having the same phase is the period, big T. And as you also know, omega times T should be 2 pi. That's one period. And solving for omega, you get 2 pi over T or 2 pi times F, since F is 1 over T. And uh, this is uh, old news, uh, I hope. But you can do the exact same analysis in the spatial domain. You can look at any one time, any one moment in time, and then consider what the waveform looks like as a function of distance. And then once again, you get a sinusoid. And then once again, there is something analogous to the period, which describes the distance between two points of equal phase. And that, you should know, is the wavelength, given by the symbol lambda. And beta times lambda must be 2 pi, just as omega times t must be 2 pi. So beta is 2 pi over lambda. Uh, I'll ask you also to note the units here. Beta must have units of radians per meter, just as omega had units of radians per second. So... Uh, what is beta? Well, we have a bunch of different names for it. Uh, a name that I particularly um, uh, think is apt is spatial frequency, because it is exactly analogous to omega, which you might say is a temporal frequency. It's also sometimes referred to as the phase propagation constant, propagation referring to the property of a wave that it seems to move energy from point to point. And uh, if you're Preferences optics, or if you're from optics, or if you're German, you might prefer the term wave number, all one word. That's uh, another uh, synonym for uh, beta. So this exact picture that I've shown up here, this recurs every T seconds, right? Once every period, I get back this exact same picture. So, a point of constant phase appears to move at a speed equal to the wavelength divided by the period, which is wavelength times frequency, and we call that quantity the phase velocity. One of the triumphs of uh, 19th century electromagnetic theory is that we know that the phase velocity for any electromagnetic wave in free space is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's approximately, but it's very close to that number. And we also know that in other media, say dielectric materials or such as glass, 
or other things, it's somewhat slower, maybe slower by as much as 50% or so. So here's the big picture. We have omega, which is usually determined by the source, right? We have something attached to an antenna, and it's creating a sinusoidally varying waveform applied to the antenna, and that's the thing that sets omega. And then we have phase velocity, which seems to be determined by two things, both omega and the medium, as I just mentioned above. So beta is 2 pi over lambda. That's 2 pi over phase velocity divided by frequency, or you can shortcut this by saying that beta equals omega over phase velocity, and uh, that's the relationship between those three things. This depends on the source, that's the frequency, and the medium. And finally, a postscript here about phasor notation. We've done this all in real-valued uh, waveform analysis, but uh, this kind of engineering analysis is traditionally done in phasor notation for good reason. So that expression for a wave, B cosine omega t minus beta r plus psi, in phasor notation would read as follows, B times e to the j psi, psi being the phase, times e to the minus j beta r, right? So this thing here, this first term in parentheses, that's a complex valued constant, that describes the magnitude and phase of the wave. And that's what we mean by magnitude and phase of that wave. The second thing here, e to the minus j beta r, is describing the evolution of phase with distance from the source. That's the propagation part. And then, of course, as always in phasor notation, we have assumed and suppressed this factor e to the j omega t, um, we agree in phasor notation on frequency, so we don't need to explicitly write it there. That concludes this lecture.